Hello, everyone. My name is Quinita Garrett, and I am the Director of Call Center and System Coordination with Baltimore Crisis Response. We are also known as BCRI, and we are located in Baltimore, Maryland. When I'm not at BCRI, I also practice as a licensed clinical professional counselor. So I'm sure many of you have heard about Baltimore City. Um, you may know what you know from what you've seen on the news and shows such as The Wire, The Corner, but Baltimore is really a beautiful place to visit and has a ton of historical content. Um, what we've always been known for is our Domino Sugar and Us factory. Um, I actually drive past that every day when I'm riding to work. Um, we used to be known for our famous jazz and blues um, content or our famous jazz and blues bands from Baltimore. We also have those beautiful brick historic row homes with the marble steps that many of you probably have seen before. And I'm almost 100% sure everyone is familiar with our harbor. Over the past year, I'm um, sorry, over the past 10 years, our harbor was actually renovated. Um, so it's been a, a really beautiful place to visit um, over the past couple of years. And we're also known for our ravens and having the best crabs in the U.S. Um, but one of the most important things to me and that I'm most proud of about um, Baltimore City is BCRI's role um, and the role that we play in Baltimore City. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about Baltimore Crisis Response. We are a 24-7 comprehensive crisis center. Uh, we provide 24-7, 365 day a year services. Um, and it all starts with our call center. Um, we have a call center that takes about 60,000 calls or more um, a year now. Um, the call center takes local calls. We're a part of 988 and then we're also a part of 911 Diversion. Um, when someone calls into 911, if the operator deems that they're having a behavioral health crisis, that operator in turn transfers that call to a BCRI counselor. And we're currently expanding that program. We're going to embed a clinician into the 911 call center, which we're super excited about. And we also recently regionalized our 98 center. Um, so historically, BCRI, we provided 98 services, but just the Baltimore City residents. But we partnered recently with other um, 98 centers and other jurisdictions. So now we can provide services in four different jurisdictions in Maryland. And we can also dispatch mobile teams to any uh, anywhere within those four jurisdictions. Um, we also have a law enforcement assistance diversion program in Baltimore at Baltimore Crisis Response. Um, individuals who get engage in low-level crimes such as marijuana usage or prostitution are given the option for case management or jail. Um, and we employ those case managers. It's a really beneficial program. Um, once that person is enrolled in case management, they're given uh, information for job training. Um, they assist them with locating jobs or finding jobs. They are given information for uh, GED programs. They're assisted with um, entitlements. Um, housing, just an array of services. So it's a really great program. Um, we also have our uh, crisis response team. So the crisis response team is a little different from our mobile crisis team. The crisis response team is a co-responder model. So this team is an officer and a therapist. We employ the therapists on this team and they respond to a high, uh, high acuity behavioral health calls um, that may involve a weapon or some level of violence where our mobile crisis team couldn't respond to. And um, we also do the CIT trainings, the crisis intervention trainings as well for law enforcement in Baltimore City. Lastly, we have a 19 bed detox unit at Baltimore Crisis Response um, where we can bring individuals in and they can detox off of opioids or heroin and alcohol. And we can also do rehab for the same three substances, but with that we can uh, do rehab for marijuana and cocaine as well. And then we have our 21 bed crisis stabilization unit. Individuals can come, they can stay 10 to 14 days for stabilization. Um, while they're on the unit, they see a therapist, they attend groups daily, they have access to 24 hour nursing, they receive medications, they can see a psychiatrist daily, and they have um, case managers that assist them with their discharge and aftercare. Um, individuals brought into the crisis unit, they're brought on by our mobile crisis team. So this is 
I'm really proud of the mobile crisis teams because we we can do a lot with the mobile crisis team and we have different um, compositions within our mobile crisis teams. So uh, we have mobile crisis teams that are dispatched directly from our call center using a software called Behavior Health Link. Um, we can see where the teams are at in real time. We can see which teams are available. We can communicate, we can communicate with the teams um, using that software. The teams can, uh, once they accept the referral, they 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 uh they they press like a button and it says when they're en route. Um, then they can tell you when they've arrived to the location, when their assessment started, when their assessment completed, and when they're um, ready for another dispatch. And the call center can mon monitor all of that um, in real time. So it's really really great. Um, so right now, our mobile crisis team can respond to Baltimore City and some surrounding counties. Uh, we have two different um, compositions. So we have a mobile crisis team that consists of a nurse and a therapist. And then we also have a mobile crisis team that consists of a therapist and a peer. All teams are dispatched through our call center and they can go anywhere in the community. They can go into a house, they can go into a school, a restaurant, we can meet you at a hospital, anywhere where you feel comfortable, the teams can meet you. Um, we've met people at bus stations before, at airports, it really doesn't matter. Um, it's really just about the client and meeting the client where they are at. It's really a seamless process. Um, the calls come in, call center can de-escalate or the call center can pro provide um, support. 90% of the calls are resolved at a call center level. However, um, when we do need to dispatch a mobile crisis team, we can do that immediately if we have one available. And the mobile crisis team, they can also transport to the next level of care. Um, as I stated, if the team goes out, if someone needs crisis stabilization, we can transport directly to that crisis unit. We can also transport directly to an outpatient appointment. Like if we're on the scene and we say we, we've stabilized and we see that you have an appointment for today, we can do transportation. We can transport to the ED. Um, it really just depends on the need of the person. We also, within that mobile crisis team, we also consult with a on-call psychiatrist. So we have access to psychiatry 24 hours a day. Um, and we consult with them just to come up with a disposition for that person. Do they need a higher level of care? Can we just provide resources? Do we need to refer them to an outpatient clinic? And one thing I forgot to mention is that we have within that behavioral health link software, we can do um, referrals to outpatient clinics. So if the mobile crisis team is out there and they have de-escalated or the person really just needs the outpatient, outpatient support, we can log into behavioral health link and we can access clinics and we can see which clinics accept their referral and we can submit the referral and the clinic will receive that referral the same day and they will contact them back for a same day or a next day appointment. So that's really, really, um, that's a really great function within the software. Um, one of the reasons that we use the nursing model is so that we can do an assessment for any medical concerns or medical needs. Um, we've been out on mobile crisis team referrals where we've seen where people have had blood pressure levels that were extremely dangerous or their sugar was at a dead level and the nurse was able to catch that and they've, we've, we've transported to the hospital um, so that they can receive the appropriate medical care. One of the new one of the new team compositions that we have is the, uh, the therapist and peer model. Um, this is a really great uh, team because I think our clients really appreciate having someone respond um, who have had a similar experience. Um, and this model works for BCRI, one, because we have a ton of support from community partners, um, and we also have support from our local um, our local core service agency who, who, who has been great with providing us with this type of peer support. Um, and people just, they, they, I think they see the benefit in having a peer on the scene because the person has been through what they've gone through or something similar. And they also get to see someone who is able to model recovery. Um, so this is what recovery looks like, or this is what success um, looks like. Um, and I am able to live a decent quality of life um, no matter what I'm going through. One thing about our mobile crisis team is that we also do hospital diversion. Um, so when someone goes into the emergency department um, and they don't necessarily meet 
criteria is the inpatient, the hospital social worker or the nurse, they contact the call center directly and we can dispatch a mobile crisis team to the emergency room. With Once they arrive to the emergency room, they do a mental health assessment. Um, and if the person is eligible, they can transport them directly from the emergency room to our crisis stabilization unit. We also do hospital step downs. Um, so if someone's on the inpatient medical unit or the inpatient site unit, they will contact us directly and we can dispatch a mobile crisis team to the hospital um, to do an assessment as well to see if that person is eligible for our crisis stabilization unit. So in all, we do 911 diversion, um, police diversion, and hospital diversion. Um, so we are also partnered with the Baltimore City Police Department and how we do police diversion for them is um, if the officer arrives on the scene and that they deem that this is not um, necessarily a, something that they should respond to and maybe a behavioral health concern, they can call us directly. Um, and they can request a mobile crisis team. If we have a mobile crisis team available, we can just dispatch to that scene, um, and, which is really helpful because it it, it avoids police um, wasting their time on the scene of something that doesn't necessarily meet criteria for a police call. Um, and it's great that and it, was, it was always great to develop that that type of relationship with law enforcement because. It allows them to have direct access to mobile crisis teams, as well as direct access to um, to um, the call center for support. Uh, what I can say is that over the past 30 years, BCRI, we've been operating. Um, we've never had an incident in the field. Um, and I attribute that to the working relationships that we have with community partners. Um, we can call on many community partners when we're in the field um, for direct care, direct access. Um, and we also attribute that to our call center. The call center does a great screening on the front end before we dispatch mobile crisis. So call center, they're actually doing like a lethality assessment just to make sure there are no dangers associated with sending a team out. So if someone has a gun, we're going to safety plan. We're going to make sure they put that gun away. Um, if someone is actively homicidal so where someone or actively suicidal the call center is going to catch that on the front end because what we do what we want to make sure is that um someone who is at imminent risk is going to receive an immediate immediate care or an immediate response and someone who is actively suicidal may need ems and um transport directly to the hospital but the great thing is that if that does happen we are also still connected um so we do a not with our 911 diversion um, program. We have a, a weekly or bi-weekly Q and A um, session where we go over these cases, um, and we see like was this handled right? Um, does this person need more support? And then the appropriate organization to do the follow up. So if I feel like it's appropriate for my organization, I'll do the follow up. And most of the time, the hospital because they already have that connection with us. That same person, um, they will contact us and they'll say, OK, this person is stabilized. Can you send your mobile team? They need extra support and we can do that as well. So all in all, it works really, really well. Um, we have great partnerships within the community. Um, our mobile crisis team, everything is interconnected. It all starts with the call center. It uh, trickles down to the mobile crisis team, and then the mobile crisis team can provide that other those other supports, whether it's for detox services, because we can transfer, di transport directly to detox, whether it's for the LEAD program, um, whether it's for our crisis stabilization unit, or whether we just have to do a referral for an outpatient clinic um, for that person to receive support. And everyone also receives follow-up. So anyone the mobile crisis team goes out on, our call center does a follow-up to make sure that they're still stabilized, to see if they need continued support, and also to see if um, they may need another mobile response or if they followed up with the resources that they were provided. Um, one thing I'm super excited about, and this is very, very new, is that we recently launched a youth, a youth mobile team. Um, so now we have a youth mobile team that can respond to adolescents in crisis ages 5 to 17. Um, and this is a therapist and a peer as well. Um, and with this model, the mobile crisis team, they'll respond to the behavioral health crisis, but they're not just responding to the adolescent. They can also respond to the parents, um, the grandparents, the, the child's entire um, support system. 
um, with that response and they have to do eight weeks of follow up. So you respond to the crisis, you provide support, you do your referral and you're doing your eight weeks of follow up to ensure that that child is still stabilized and that that, that the parents or the um, guardian followed up on the, on the referral or the resources that were provided. Um, so the great thing about the youth services is that we can service the adolescents in the school. Um, so if the school is, has an adolescent that's experiencing a behavior health crisis, um, we can respond. The school would just contact us. We would contact the guardian if they're under 13 and we can respond to that school. Um, so we are super excited about that. Like I said, it's a really it's a new program for us, but we are um, excited to add youth to our mobile crisis team um, model. Um, historically, we've always dealt with adults. So now we're, it's just exciting to have add youth to that because it's definitely needed to have mobile services for adolescents experiencing the behavioral health crisis. Um, so yeah, BCRI, we have our call center, we have our mobile crisis, we have stabilization. Um, we really just wanna make sure that consumer or that client, um, the continuum of care, um, when we're servicing them, that um, we are connecting them to the, the most appropriate supports, whether that's internally for us or whether that's for someone external. As, so some of the challenges we've experienced over the past two years, I would say since COVID is with hiring. Um, I think for people to do crisis work, you really have to that's something you really have to want to do. Um, and with the remote possibilities now, um, a lot of clinicians, they have remote options. Um, and you really have to want to go into the field to respond to a crisis. Um, so we that, that's been a challenge for us over the past two years is really with hiring clinicians um, and also with hiring peers as well. Um, that's kind of been difficult. And I think that's been difficult because uh, People want peers, which is definitely understandable. Um, and peers can work in a hospital, which is great. Um, so we were just looking for those peers that want to do crisis work, those therapists and those peers that want to do crisis work, as well as nurses, too. We've uh, It's just been a challenge. And although it's been a challenge, we've been able to make it work. Um, we have a great team here who is always willing and able to provide support. Um, and when we, and I know when COVID hit, we had to um, redo a ton of our policies and procedures. And uh, we had a 21 bed crisis stabilization unit. And then we took our beds down to 12. Our mobile crisis team had to adjust. Um, and, and they still went out into the community. Um, and it was really that big unknown. So they, they everyone really adjusted really, really well. But hiring is still continues to be a challenge. Um, Meeting the demand sometimes can be a challenge. Um, people, crisis just doesn't stop. And, you, and even though we try to provide as many teams as we can, as much support as we can, you just never know how long it's going to take on the scene to uh, de-escalate or respond to a crisis. So we can send a team out and sometimes we can de-escalate within an hour and we can respond to the next situation. But there are situations or times when we sent a team out and it could, they could stay on the scene for two, three, four hours. So um, we'll have a team um, out for four hours and then another crisis will come in. So sometimes just meeting the demand of um, trying to respond to those behavioral health crises, that can be a challenge as well, especially when you're already short staffed. Um, but it has picked up slightly, but we are struggling with hiring at times. Another challenge can sometimes be with education. Um, people understanding what we can actually respond to. Uh, and there's there's a fear of police within certain communities and um, people don't want police to respond, which is definitely understandable. But um, the mobile crisis team, you know, it's, it's, it's a therapist and a peer or a nurse um, and they're just coming out themselves. They have a plain clothes. We have a regular truck, car, no, no signage, no anything. So you really don't know sometimes that it's Baltimore crisis response. Um, and they're just coming out with themselves and their skills, um, their skills to de-escalate, their skills to, uh, to provide resources and just relate in an empathetic way. But they wouldn't be able to de-escalate like a, a, a violent situation where someone is attacking someone. Um, it may be a behavioral health crisis, but if they're attacking someone in the moment, 
or uh, maybe um, there's a domestic situation and the person is actively violent. Uh, mobile crisis team really wouldn't be appropriate for that. And I think sometimes um, that's where the education piece come in because we all think it call us, which is understandable. Um, family members call us, say, I have a family member. They definitely have some behavioral health concerns. You know, they've been in and out of the hospital for mental health issues. But now they're destroying my house and they just punched me in the face. Can you send your, send your mobile crisis team out? Our mobile crisis team can be on standby for support. However, they're not going to be able to um, respond to someone who is actively violent. Um, and I think that's sometimes that's frustrating for family members or third party callers when they hear that. But we but but the team does try to provide support in any type of way. We we're on standby. You know, if police come and they see that there's no danger in it, um, no danger in that in that area, or they've already um, kind of de-escalated the danger, then the mobile crisis team is always on standby and can always um, come in and provide support as well. And that's the great thing about our crisis response team. You know, it does involve police, but the therapist is still there. The therapist with that team, they always take the lead. And the police is kind of there in the background to provide support if needed. But the goal is for our therapists with that team to always take lead as well. So thank you for viewing this presentation. I hope I was able to provide some um, helpful context around uh, how we operate our crisis center and our mobile crisis services. Um, and I hope that you all will come to visit Baltimore one day and enjoy our harbor and some of our um, just the scenery and are you able to visit Baltimore crisis response as well and kind of see it in action one day yourself. So thank you for watching this. I appreciate it and enjoy. Baltimore Crisis Response Incorporated, also known as BCRI, is the city's first and only crisis intervention service. We have been operating since 1992 and provide a full range of mental health crisis and substance abuse treatment services, including a 24-hour crisis hotline where people can call in to get assistance. We also have mobile crisis teams that go out and see people in their homes, street corners, other locations in the community, provide assessment, stabilization, and intervention. We also have residential services where people come in and stay with us for short periods of time receive treatment, get stabilized, get supportive counseling, can receive medication. We provide a number of the same services that someone would get if they were admitted to a hospital. And we also do substance abuse treatment services. We have a short residential detoxification service that detoxes individuals from alcohol, opiates, and benzodiazepines. BCRI also provides case management services to support people in the community. And finally, we respond to traumatic events as they happen in the community. Not, you know, when, when it, people are in crisis and when bad things happen, sometimes it's not just the individual, but the community that's affected. So we'll go out to scenes where there's been perhaps a sudden death or a suicide or something that's upsetting and try and provide supportive services and get people who require assistance the assistance that they need. So really anything that relates to crisis services is within the scope of our mission. Well, our partnership with the Baltimore City Police Department started in 2005. We have been doing something that's called the BEST training, and BEST stands for Behavioral Emergency Services Team. And this is essentially where we train police officers to, to be effective when dealing with people in a behavioral health crisis. There is an exercise that's called virtual voices. And this is where officers actually put on headphones that simulate what it's like to have auditory hallucinations. Part two is that they then have to do some basic daily task. 
So they begin to appreciate what it's like to walk around with voices in your head saying bad stuff to you and trying to function. And the feedback that we've gotten from officers is, gee, I never understood that before. And so what that has done is to make some of the officers really more empathetic when engaging people with a mental illness and with acute psychiatric symptoms. So they understand you have to slow down. This is a different kind of police work. You don't necessarily want to issue commands. You want to try to engage that person. You also don't want to give, you know, speak in long sentences. You want simple, basic things to be able to engage people. Number three is that they have an opportunity to practice the skills that they're learning that we're teaching them. And this is done through role plays. Various scenarios, you come in, you're trying to engage somebody that's agitated, that's having major psychiatric symptoms, that maybe is in a suicidal crisis, or maybe is giving, you know, a family member a hard time. What do you do when you arrive on the scene? So they actually have a chance to practice the skills. There's a lot of benefit for both organizations, but the bottom line is the real benefit is for that citizen who's in distress. That's really the take home message. Help is available. All you gotta do is pick up the phone and call us. Mm -hmm.